I have prepared a message that I actually prepared for last week. So it's good to be back with you all uh, this week after having to miss a Sunday last week. I had a couple kiddos that were um, not feeling very well and had been exposed to COVID, so we had to get negative tests, which didn't come until Monday of, last, of this past week. So, but we're all happy and healthy and feeling a lot better now. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, we've been in a series called Man Camp, and today I'm going to be uh, talking about a man named Joshua. So I'm going to start with a word of prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get right into it. God, again, we just thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to gather together. And uh, God, I just pray that you, uh, as I am speaking, God, I just pray that you give me the words to speak. Uh, give us the, the ears to hear what you have to say to us, and uh, the minds to understand, and the hearts to obey you, God. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to start off just by reading um, from the book of Joshua, the first nine verses. So Joshua 1, starting in verse 1. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, Son of Nun, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. <clears throat> be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So in this series, we've been looking at men of the Bible because we are issuing a challenge to the men of the church. We believe that strong men build strong families, strong churches, and strong communities. Of course, we don't mean to exclude any of the ladies by doing this in these messages. And we believe that there is something for everyone. But we specifically want to challenge the men to be like these men of God from the Bible. There are numerous stories in Scripture of people who have been embraced and celebrated because of their faith and the impact of their lives. They lived stories worth telling. Throughout the series, we've been looking at their stories to see what we can learn from them for our lives. Again, the man we're looking at today is Joshua. If there's one word to describe Joshua, it's courage. The word courage shows up five times in just the first 18 verses of the book of Joshua. But if we're going to talk about courage, it's important for us to have an understanding of of what that word means. Because often we can confuse courage with bravery. Right? We might think of them as synonyms. But bravery, at least for this message, this is the understanding I'm working with. Bravery is having the guts to do something that involves risks. Bravery is the ability to confront pain or danger without any feeling of fear. But courage is different. Courage comes from the Latin word for core, meaning heart. So courage literally means strength of the heart. It is having the strength to do what is right in the face of fear, undertaking an overwhelming difficulty or pain despite the eminent and unavoidable presence of fear. More than a quality, it is a state of mind. Driven by a cause that makes the struggle all worth it. 
It is the willful choice to fight, regardless of the consequences. And this is why we love our heroes so much, whether that be on the silver screen, or in literature, or people in our communities. We celebrate them because they have the strength to do what is right in the face of fear and great danger. Courage is absolutely essential if we are going to live a life worth telling, namely because of the ever-present reality of fear in our lives. Fear is one of the biggest drivers in our lives. In fact, studies have found that fear is the basis of most of our first and early memories. How many of you have as one of your earliest memories getting lost or being afraid of the dark or another experience shaped by fear? I have my earliest memory is when I actually fell in a hole and my dad had to pull me out. Now, I'm not even sure if that's an actual memory or not. Or just, I've heard the story so many times that I kind of made it into a memory in my head. I think I might have actually told that from up here before. But for, for many people, that's true that our earliest memory is of a time that we were afraid. One of the biggest challenges of living a, a story worth telling is the effect that fear has over our lives. How much of what we don't do or how much of what we do, of what we say or what we don't say, has to do with fear. The fear of what other people will think of us. The fear of rejection and the fear of failure all impact us. How many of, how, how many of us have regrets, and what role did fear play because you didn't do what you knew you should do? Think about that question for a second. Think about some of your biggest regrets from your life. What role did fear play in those regrets? You didn't do something that you knew you should do because you were afraid. How many of you feel stuck right now? How is fear been holding you back. The kind of stories we love involve both risk and sacrifice, and that brings up fear. If we're committed to living a story worth telling, then fear is going to be an ever-present reality in our lives. The question becomes, how can we have the courage to do what we know needs to be done? The story of Joshua has a lot to teach us about that. I'm not going to tell the whole story of Joshua. It's a whole book in the Bible. Hopefully, after hearing this message, you'll be encouraged to go and read it for yourself. Joshua succeeded Moses in leading the Hebrew people out of the wilderness and into the Promised Land. So Israel has been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because the previous generation allowed fear to get the best of them. They were afraid to fully commit to and trust God. They were afraid of the people in the promised land. They were afraid of the unknown. This journey before them looms larger than life. All of this together impacts them. When Moses sent 12 spies for reconnaissance into the promised land, only two of them, Joshua and Caleb, came back confident they could take possession of the land. In our scripture today, the Hebrew people are on the edge of the promised land and Joshua is the chosen one to lead them into it. Our scripture today could be described as God's pep talk for Joshua. Obviously, Joshua is dealing with a lot of fear. Who wouldn't be? If not, God would not have to tell him so many times not to be afraid and to be courageous. Imagine just for a moment, put yourself in Joshua's shoes and Joshua's shoes and think about, I'm, I'm not that close to him, I don't call him Josh, Joshua. Joshua's shoes. Put yourself in his shoes and just think about what he was facing. He has to fill the shoes of Moses, who defeated Pharaoh. Pharaoh, who was considered literally a god among men by the people of Egypt. He had to fill the shoes of Moses, who parted the waters of the Red Sea. Moses, who met with God face to face and led the people for 40 years. And what's worse, even after Moses had accomplished all this, Moses wasn't allowed to lead the people into the promised land. 
And that's who Joshua has to succeed. And now a group of former slaves are supposed to go into this new land and defeat the people inhabiting it who are living in fortified, walled cities. So, what do we learn about the story from Joshua? First, first thing we learn is that God is the source of courage. In Joshua 1, verses 5 and verse 9, it says, No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then in 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Courage comes from an awareness of the presence of God in our lives. One of the reasons we give in to fear is because we focus on what we are up against and take our focus off the one who is with us. Now, today is the Packers' first game of the NFL season. Okay, so you don't think I'm going to let it slip by without using a sports analogy here. Sometimes when I'm looking at the Packers' schedule, who they're going to face, today we're, look, we're playing against the Saints. So I look at it like, oh, Saints. they have Alvin Kamara, they have James Winston, they have Taysom Hill, they have this player and this player and this player. They're tough. They're going to be good. But then I'm focusing on the opponent rather than we have Aaron Rodgers and we have Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams and Kevin King down here in the front row. Right? <laughs> now, so we have, we have our focus on the enemy, what we're up against, instead of who's with us. And the difference is, there's a saying in, in football, any given Sunday. Any team can be any team any given Sunday, right? That's the difference, because when we have God on our side, no one can stand against us. So life can look awfully scary when we lose touch with the presence of God in our lives. Everything looks bigger, scarier, more threatening, and more catastrophic. We do this all the time. Our, our boss brings a small suggestion of critical feedback, and suddenly we think, oh man, we're getting, I'm getting fired. Or our kid gets a D on a test in seventh grade, and we think he or she's going to end up in juvie. Fear can take on a life of its own and magnify everything negative. Instead, we need to refocus on the one who has promised to be with us no matter what we face. The God who created all of this, the God who knows all, and the God who will never forsake us. Second, we learn from Joshua that courage is not the absence of fear. It is the proper allocation of fear. Courage is a matter of being afraid of the right things. The most frequent command in Scripture, does anyone know what it is? Fear not, or do not fear. Do not be afraid. The second most common command, fear the Lord. So do not fear, and fear the Lord. Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So when scripture talks about the fear of the Lord, it doesn't mean being afraid of God, that he's going to seek vengeance and justice and punish us. Fear of the Lord is having an understanding of who God is in light of who we aren't. It is a sense of awe of who God is and what God can do. When we claim that and live with a healthy fear of the Lord, we can embrace the kind of courage that can overcome any obstacle. Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, who is against us? In Philippians, Paul, who is facing death, writes, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. When you take the fear, even the fear of death, away, because you have the promise of eternal life, watch out, because you become a dangerous weapon of the kingdom of God. Then absolutely nothing can overwhelm you or frighten you, because you're in the loving hand, care, and presence of God. I don't know about you, but... I want to be a dangerous weapon for the kingdom of God. Courage comes from being afraid 
of the right things. When we have courage, we move from what will happen if I do this to what will happen if I don't do this. Courage comes from an awareness of the abiding presence of God. So how do we make that a reality in our lives? Joshua 1, verses 7 and 8 says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. When we hear the word law, we think of rules and regulations, do's and don'ts. But in Hebrew, the word law is Torah, which means teaching and instruction. God says to meditate on it, soak in it, and let it become a part of who you are. The single most important thing you can do is to carve out time for yourself to be in God's word. And read it every day. To remind yourself of who God is, what he has done, the promise he has made and fulfilled and is still fulfilling. Meditate until God dwells in you. It's said that it takes about 24 hours to lose a healthy fear of God. 24 hours. Right? Picture, you know, maybe when your kids are, if you went to a, a church camp or revival experience or anything like that, and you get on that spiritual high for God, and then even as soon as 24 hours later, you can be back down. If courage comes from living with the presence of God, then shouldn't we be actually meeting with God daily? Third, courage means stepping into God's identity for you. Through his 40 years in the wilderness, God asked the people to reenact significant events in their journey. In chapter 2, they sent spies to scout out the land, just as they had done before. In chapter 3, Joshua parts the Jordan River, just like Moses did to the Red Sea. In chapter 5, God instructs the people to perform circumcision and to celebrate Passover, just like they did 40 years before. Why does God do this? In chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, it says, The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There's no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. Manna was the food of the wanderers, the ones who allowed fear to get the best of them. God stopped the manna because they were no longer wanderers, but produce of the land was for conquerors. This was a brand new day for a whole new generation, and fear did not have to get the best of them. God had them reenact all these things because he wanted to make clear that with him, they were conquerors and able to overcome. They were reminding, he was reminding them of their identity in him. In other words, the, the failure of the past doesn't have to keep you from your identity in God. As Christians today, we believe this as well. Because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, things can change. Today doesn't have to be like yesterday. The scriptures say that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. If we put our faith in him, then we're putting our faith in a God who performs resurrection. That means when everybody else sees a dead end, we see that something incredible is about to happen. What have you given up on? What are you saying can't or won't happen in Christ? How are you allowing your past experience or your present circumstance to dictate what is and isn't possible? Romans 8, 37 and 38 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Fourth thing we learn from Joshua, that courage requires you and I to commit to a big vision 
the small steps. The invitation to follow Jesus is to live with courage. It's to live with the audacity that because of Jesus Christ, all things are possible. Living a life with courage requires us to live with a big vision. And that vision is God's plan for salvation. And the building of his kingdom in our midst through our words, our actions, and the lives that we lead. Some of us maybe have never experienced that. But just because it may be true doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. The invitation is to make it a reality with our lives and in our lives to partner with God and to show the world what it means to really follow Jesus and let them know the love of Christ in us. It's to show the world what the church can be and what it can do when God is in our midst, when we are committed to and completely sold out Completely sold out to his mission. And his presence inhabits our praises and our life together. The invitation of Jesus is to live with the courage of Jesus and live with a kingdom of God-sized vision and to believe that because of Jesus Christ, all things are possible. You have to have a big vision, but then you also have to realize that it is carried out in small steps. God says to Joshua, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I have promised Moses. The Israelites took hold of God's promise, and they crossed over into the promised land. And they realized who they were one step at a time. After chapter 1, the remaining 23 chapters are living out the promises of God and making it a reality. One victory at a time. We can get discouraged by the vision. Because when we look at it, it can seem too big. How can we ever make that happen? But we have to commit to taking it one step at a time. So today I want to ask you, what is your next step? What's the next step that you need to take in your business, in your marriage, in your family, in your church, in your community? No one can ever solve a problem in one fell swoop. But you can one day and one decision at a time. Keep your eyes on the vision, but commit to taking one step at a time, that next step. Dallas Willard was a professor of theology, and he was being interviewed, and he was asked this question, what's the key to following Jesus? Kind of a broad question. But he answered, love God with all you got, and then commit to do next right thing. Victories are won in the everyday battles. So what's the next right thing in your life? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for the story of Joshua. God, we thank you for the, the courage that we see in his life that serves as a, a model for our own lives. God, I pray that you give each one of us here the desire, the hunger to get into your word and read every day to know you better. God, to become more like you, to take the next step, however small it is. God, help us to recognize that next step. God, the way that we do that, the way we walk and step with you is by knowing you. The way we know you is by reading your word. God, we just thank you again. And we love you. And this is your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with us again as we close.